Many thanks to Ashley, one of my favorite people in all the world for inviting me today, and to Amy and Ian and all the staff here for their tremendous organizational work. And thanks to all of you for coming here this evening. Uh, so my talk, The Media Crease, Traces of Reuse in Hard and Soft Copies, starts with romance novels. Um, I'm going to begin with a, with a series of material objects and romance novels are my first one. So several years ago, I went to a bookstore that sold used books as well as new books. And I noticed that the used in the used romance novel section, many of the books and nearly all of them in fact, had multiple creases in the spines indicating where a previous owner had reread specific sections multiple times. And in many cases, the creases marked the good parts meaning the sex scenes, uh, but not all of the creases were sex scenes. Some of them were just very emotionally charged conversations between the hero and heroine. And so you could see how those are also passionate parts of the book. So I would say most of the creases marked the most passionate parts of the books, uh, whether that was sex or sort of these fights that were like the, the foreplay um, to the sex scenes. But they were all... Um, about passion and intensity and other very strong affects in romantic relationships. Uh, the next um, object I'm going to talk about is vinyl records. So what is the marker of use in a vinyl record analogous to the creases in the spine of a romance novel? For me, it's the deepened groove. So I remember being a child and playing my older siblings Beatles records and in the upper right photo, um, you'll see a Beatles LP. And I would replay certain songs so much that it seemed to me that the grooves marking the beginnings of those songs deepened considerably over time. That said, there is some debate about whether repeated playings actually deepen record grooves, but I know that among some vinyl enthusiasts, the rule is that if you want to preserve a record in pristine condition, you'll only play a given song once per day, and then you'll let the record rest and allow the vinyl to recover, rather than replaying certain songs over and over and over and over as I did when I was a child. Next, let's consider videotapes with glitches. I'm going to play a clip from Josh Johnson's 2013 documentary about video culture called Rewind This. And I'll issue some warnings now. This clip contains adult themes, nudity, strong language, fake blood splatters. So here we go. that all video store owners know. When you're watching a movie and That's there's a like glitch and you're like, oh, it's gonna get nude in two seconds. Here, here's a news flash. Nudity was gigantic with teenage boys. It was a big thing back in the 80s. Watching a videotape as a kid and when you could start to see the lines rolling through the picture, you know that someone's watched it a lot at that point and you know that there's gonna be tits coming on soon. You get ready, you sit up in your chair because you think, holy shit, some fucking weird pervert has watched this part so many times that I'm ready for uh, the money shot. When you watch a VHS tape, there's almost like an archaeology that you can do on it where there's this history written into the physical material of the thing itself. You get to see the parts that are really beat up. You know that someone like rewound that and watched it over and over. It's like the part where there's boobs or the part where the guy explodes. You know, like, you know that was someone's favorite part and they, they couldn't get enough. <laughs> the first I think anybody ever had the power over being able to see boobs again and again and again and again and again. Cable had been a reality in our lives, so you could see boobs, but they were, then they were gone, and they were just a golden memory. I had a, a videotape of Kentucky Fried Movie, and I lent it to the friend, and when he gave it back, it was like just every 10 minutes or something, it was go flip, 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 and I'd be like, you watched all those nude scenes over and over again, and in one weekend, because that my tape is ruined, but it's also kind of funny and whenever I watch it I can like think of you being gross and hilarious. My Ghostbusters tape, I bet people can't even make out the whole scene where he goes, I came, I saw, I kicked some ass because I, I thought that was the greatest shit ever when I was a kid. I, I rewound that scene, I was like, whoa, he kicked some ass. That is what Ghostbusters do. 
So what induced rewinding and glitching and videotapes were what one of the interviewees calls somebody's favorite part and another calls the greatest shit ever. And let's note that, as with the romance novels, a lot of these favorite parts involve nudity, but not all of them. Someone's favorite part could also be the funny part or sometimes the really gross part, but it was often the sex part. And let me also note that one of the interviewees referred to the person who rewound the tape enough to cause glitching as some weird pervert. And another referred to his friend who glitched up his tape of Kentucky Fried Movie as gross and hilarious. So there's condemnation of this practice of repeatedly rewinding the media object to the good part so much that the tape glitches, but there's also also amusement at that same practice. I use the term media crease to refer to all of these practices of repeated playback and intensive reuse that often results in damage to the hard copy, skipping, blurring, erasure, and so on. Here is my definition of the media crease. The media crease, the hard copy version, is the material trace of an individual user's repeated playback of a segment of recorded media. This trace is often a deformation of the object. Arnold Fetveit, in his essay, Medium Specific Noise, states that many um, artists of all genres have been interested in purposefully incorporating glitches, scratches, and errors in their works as an aesthetic style, what Arnold calls a noisy aesthetic. And that employment of the media crease as a purposeful aesthetic choice is evident in this next piece I'm going to discuss. Wen Tan Huang's KIP, an experimental film made in 2002, consists of images of Wen inserted into a 1970s gay porn film featuring the famous actor, porn actor Kip Knoll. In her book Time Binds, queer theorist Elizabeth Freeman, uh, analyzing this work, writes that Wen extracted his images of the porn film from a video cassette that he had rented from Tower Video in the Castro, and that the tape, quote, had a parent been rewound too many times to the most explicit sex scene so that the images now skipped and repeated and entire frames were blurred or erased. In other words, writes Freeman, uh, the hottest part of the tape, as Wen puts it, appeared in his viewing of it as instances returning to themselves over and over and as a series of leaps across the bodily gestures or sexual choreographies that we are ordinarily supposed to experience as smooth, continuous, and natural. Wen's work speaks to mass popular ways of using filmic temporality to expand bodily possibilities and of using the body's rhythms to reimagine in what film can say and do. For renters of the video cassette could zoom the tape backward to the money shot as often as they wanted, witnessing multiple climaxes far beyond the capacity of the male body to produce them. And apparently this is exactly what these viewers did. So while the straight porn aficionados referenced in Rewind This could use rented videotapes to see, quote, boobs again and again and again, in the words of one of the interviewees, the gay porn aficionados who patronized Tower Video in the Castro could rewind to see male orgasms again and again and again. Freeman finds in KIP an exemplar or staging of how queer porn can queer time, making time loop, and it can queer sex, multiplying climaxes and, as she states, quote, derailing the normative progression of sexual intercourse from foreplay to penetration to climax. Freeman's book is about queer temporalities, and I read this section of the book as her pointing to the media crease as a, quote, mass popular way of using filmic temporality to expand bodily possibility, end quote, associating the crease with libidinal investments and an expansion of possibilities for both bodies and media formats. But what happens to the media crease in digital formats? Theoretically, digital files can be copied repeatedly with no degradation or lossiness. There are exceptions. For instance, editing and resaving a JPEG file in an image editor will almost certainly result in some degradation of the image. So we might consider the digital media crease to make itself known in another way, through repetition. 
Here's an example of how I see the media crease working in a digital space, specifically on the social microblogging platform Tumblr. I'm going to play a screen recording of my scrolling through the hashtag BellArcHug on October 9, 2015. Bellark is a portmanteau referring to Bellamy Blake and Clark Griffin, two of the heroes of the CW sci-fi series The Hundred, which is a futuristic dystopian scenario that is part Lord of the Flies and part Swiss Family Robinson. Uh, Bellamy and Clark are not romantically involved at all in the show, but they nevertheless have attracted a large base of shipper fans or fans who want to see them in a romantic relationship. In a scene in the show's second season, Bellamy and Clark reunite after being separated for several episodes, and Clark, the blonde, gives Bellamy a hug in greeting. It's the most physical contact that the two characters uh, ever had on the show. So here's a tour through that tag. So one of my propositions is that GIFing is the new glitching, or rather that users uploads of various media files based on the same source material, so GIFs, pics, screenshots, and fan vids, all based on this one minute scene from this TV series, all appearing in this hashtag, is the digital equivalent of glitching up a video cassette. It's, quote, someone's favorite part. Actually, it's many people's favorite part, over and over and over and over again. Here's a post on Tumblr in the hashtag that summarizes how this repetitive stream of images works as a glitch. Quote, I love gifts of the Bellark hug. You can stare at them for eternity. They will never stop hugging. And the poster gives their signature as, shit, I am in too deep. Here's how I see the media crease working on another social microblogging platform, Twitter. This is a screen recording of my scrolling through the hashtag Black Bruins Matter on October 9, 2015, three days after a UCLA fraternity and sorority jointly threw a party with a Kanye West theme to which a number of the white party goers wore blackface and uploaded their pics to social media sites. Twitter users expressed their outrage using a variant on the popular tag Black Lives Matter called Black Bruins Matter. The Bruin is the mascot of UCLA. CLA. In this hashtag, the image repeated most frequently is this one, which was the main photo used in the LA Times story about the party. The LA Times caption for the photo reads, photos posted on Instagram purportedly show students at the Sigma Phi Epsilon house with charcoal smeared on their cheeks and foreheads during a Kanye Western themed party Tuesday night. And this Instagram photo, which appeared over and over again in the hashtag on Twitter, definitely has some libidinal affects. It's not divorced from the kind of libidinal economy that includes straight and gay porn and romance novels um, or romantic or quasi-romantic relationships between characters and television shows. But also, in addition to any titillation this offers, which is probably heightened by the racial and cultural drag being enacted, this is a case of the media crease showing not someone's favorite part, but someone's least favorite part, someone's most hated part. Here's how I see the media crease at work on Amazon's social reading platform, Kindle. This is a screenshot of my Kindle copy of Helen Freshwater's book, Theater and Audience, and you can see that this sentence has been highlighted by 17 Kindle users. Throughout a Kindle book, a reader will find multiple sections marked this way, showing that these passages were several people's favorite part, and they probably intend to reread those passages. And here are just a few uh, more screenshots of places where the number of highlighters appeared in my digital copy of the book. I'm sure there are books that are 
far more popular and have many more highlighters than 16 to 19. But 16 to 19 highlighters still seems like quite a lot of people whose preferences, that is, whose favorite parts of this book, are brought to my attention as I read it for the first time. When 1980s videotape renters rented softcore porn films, what if every glitch they saw had a little pop-up bubble that stated the number of previous renters who had rewound the tape to that particular moment? So digital technologies and emerging cultural practices that make use of those technologies call for a redefinition of the media crease. Here's my definition of the soft copy version of the media crease. A networked trace in digital space of a shared will to repeatedly use a segment of recorded media. This trace can manifest as reproduction, for example, reblogging or retweeting, as reinforcing, for example, uploading similar content using a hashtag initiated by others, or upvoting, for example, highlighting, linking, favoriting, bookmarking. Why am I using this term media crease when we have other terms or concepts that already seem to describe the digital phenomena that I'm talking about? We have meme, virality, and Henry Jenkins' corrective to virality, spreadability. We have the simple, long-standing idea of popularity. We have the term trend and the word so often used by social media sites, trending. But these are all terms or concepts or metaphors that describe the distribution of media, the expansion or reach of media texts. But what if we are not interested in distribution, but in the user's experience of media? To describe the user's experience of digital media, we must propose terms or concepts or metaphors that describe contraction and repetition. And one of these is crease. We also have glitch, the hottest part of the tape, the break, as, as Craig Watson says, there in ev Watkins says, in every great record, there is an even greater part, the get down part. Um, we could talk about kinks or turn-ons. Uh, we could talk about what Deleuze calls folds or compressions that are also multiplications. We can talk about niches or narrow casting, and of course, uh, we can talk about hashtags, um, search tools for media creases, and finally, fandom. So let me compare the hard copy or analog crease to the soft copy or digital crease. In the case of the hard copy crease, an individual repeatedly re-experiences a section of media. There is deformation of an analog object. Uh, there is a glitch, a skip, a blur. There is what Tom Gunning calls the scratch, which is a mark on the surface of a film. There is information inscribed into a material object that is owned or rented by the user. In the case of the soft copy crease, a network repeatedly experiences a section of media. There is a deformation of a digital stream or a feed, um, which is not about novelty, but is about, and not about discovery, but is about recurrence and re-encounter. So that deformation of your social media feed is not about flow, but freeze, as if your social media feed gets stuck on an image. There is a kink, a stutter, a loop. People say, it's all over my feed, or I'm spending all of my time in that tag. There is a, something akin to a DJ scratch, a back and forth motion of repetitive replay of a micro section of a song. And there is data stored in servers owned by organizations, often corporations. There are two ways that I think of the media crease, as concave and as convex. On this slide, I'll list some of the ways that I think of the concave crease. Here's the crease, and I imagine the user's psyche to be represented by this ball here, rolling around back and forth inside of the crease. And the crease here is pictured as a recession, an indent, a hollow in which you spend time, a niche that you inhabit for a little while, a curve in which you roll from side to side repeatedly like a physics problem. 
Okay, let's look at the ways I'm thinking about the concave crease. And this is sort of an associative list of um, descriptions of the concave crease or the crease as concave. I think of it as oscillation and over and over and over and over again, as we heard in Rewind This. Um, repetition as compulsion, discipline, therapy, self-soothing, pleasure. It's akin to scratching and itch. It's akin to masturbation. It's really getting into it um, or being really into something, being in a groove. It's deep. It's reading deeply, feeling deeply, having a deep commitment, a deep attachment, a deep love for a media object, being in too deep, as the Bellark um, hashtagger said. It's immersion, swimming, drowning, wallowing like a pig in mud. It's guilt and celebration. Fans sometimes use the hashtag trash, um, calling themselves uh, or the media object the best kind of trash or I'm shipper trash. Um, so that's a way to tag something as useless and awesome, calling it or oneself the best kind of garbage, calling oneself a pig in mud rather than calling um, that experience guilty pleasure. It's mining a media text for meaning, doing close reading, doing textual analysis. It's a relishing and reveling in. It's a dwelling in, or what Heidegger would call indwelling. It's a hiding, a covering, a burying. It's plunging beneath the surface, diving into the subtext, also diving into one's unconscious, perhaps. It's prolonging, attenuating, extending, repeatedly experiencing the best brief part, someone's favorite part, the hottest part, the get down part. And here are the ways I'm thinking about the convex crease. For the media crease can be thought of as a convex occurrence, uh, consisting of a protrusion, a jutting out, as much as it can be thought of as a concave occurrence. These aspects of the crease are far more present in social media instances of the crease than in hard copy instances. So let's take a look at how I'm imagining the digital media crease as convex. I think of it as a standing out, a coming out, a pushing up, a pushing out, finding like-minded others, finding your own kink communities, bringing something to consciousness that was unconscious or subconscious. Uh, it's about sharing. It's about publishing, publicizing. It's about exposure, identification, naming, visibility, locating, rallying together, recruiting others into your kink community, gathering people there. Uh, it's about accretion, augmentation, progression. It's about volume of people. It's about complexity, finding all the dimensions of something that you share. And there are some transhistorical and transmedia aspects of the crease. In other words, there are similarities between how the crease operates in romance novels, vinyl records, video cassettes, on Tumblr, on Twitter, on fan sites, on Kindle. So here are some of those similarities. Uh, the crease is always libidinal. It's always about want and need, pleasure, and what Roland Barthes called jouissance, which is, which is a pleasure so keen and sharp it's orgasm. It's about compulsion. It's also about that guilt slash celebration combination. It always proves that the consumer or user has the power to deform mass-produced media, to impose their preferences on its structure, to bend that mass product to their will. It always divorces, quote, fan time, personal time, or female time, or queer time from media time. It always expands possibilities for using media to discover and revel in one's internal drives, proclivities, orientations, identifications. It always is possible to dive or delve into the crease, theorizing why a user or network creates a crease uh, where, where they do, why that is their case why that is their break. So on the one hand, the digital crease, or we could call it the social media crease, 
as a concave crease promotes diversity, tolerance, and a feeling of community among media users because it kinks the culture industries, it imposes libidinal preferences onto mass media, it also manifests through these parties uh, of uploading, posting, editing, writing, vitting. Um, it provides or it, you know lives in a mode of carnivalesque communal feasting on a media object. It facilitates wider acknowledgement of the diverse modes of reception, divergent interpretations and perspectives, divergent wills to customize and personalize mass media. It plays a part in the creation of massive and micro communities, fandoms, networks. It encourages an ethic of tolerance in fan cultures. There is this abbreviation which appears, which means your kink is not my kink and that's okay. Or your kink is okay. Uh, so that ethic of accepting that um, there's difference in kinks. In, it ensures that mass media content does not flow or stream smoothly, but is creased differently by different users. So here is um, what I call the um, industrial cultural product, which could be a film, a book, a record, a uh, television series. And um, here is the media crease. And you see that the way that people crease that industrial cultural product um, are subcultural. Uh, they are ways that people personalize them, draw them into themselves and make them their own. But at the same time, when we think of the social media crease as a convex crease, we perceive the dark side of the crease. The crease as a locating mechanism, as a marker that allows individuals to locate themselves and their preferences in the social fabric, but also then media users and their preferences can be located far more easily. So here the crease makes groups of people, taste cultures and subcultural scenes visible and public, subject to identification and capture. It transforms people with personal preferences into what Heidegger would call human resources, free labor that sustains and increases the utility, appeal, and liveliness or shelf life of mass media product, products. Um, fans do the labor of customization, the label of the labor of useful compression, and it creates new niche markets for narrow casting or pandering. Um, in fan cultures, there's this term queer baiting, which means that uh, usually a television series or, but it could be a film, will offer up scenes um, of homosociality, of sort of homoerotic tension between same-sex characters. They'll bait the audience with a uh, kind of a media crease that it knows the audience likes, but they'll never fully deliver on transforming that relationship into a romance. Um, it's, it's queer baiting because it's a way to draw audience in without ever giving them what they really came for. So here's the convex media crease. Here's um, the industrial, oh sorry, the industrial uh, product, again, this green line. And here's the, con the vex crease, the way that people customize that industrial media product. But here's this blue line that I call the line of capture, because there's some part of the way that people crease a media product that allows their data to be collected and allows them to become visible to the media industries and to advertisers and other uh, ancillary businesses that profit from the media industries. So um, now I'm gonna to turn to a different set of problems which have to do with when reuse ceases. So I'm gonna talk about what I call the media cut. The media cut is when a user feels wounded by their deep durational affinity for and investment in a media text because the can maybe because the canon of the text disappoints them, it doesn't go the way they wanted and needed it to go. One manifestation of this is rage quitting or complete dismissal. I'm never gonna watch that again. Um, my sister, who's a big Sean Bean fan, felt this way about Game of Thrones at the end of season one. Uh, I had this moment of rage quitting Downton Abbey. I won't explain why right now, but everybody who's ever watched How I Met Your Mother knows that television sitcom ended with the worst series finale in the history of television. And so both my sister and me will never watch that show ever again. 
Um, there's a, there can be a feeling of it's too soon or it'll always be too soon. This profound mourning for a loss. After Glenn Fry's passing, I can't listen to one of my favorite bands, the Eagles. I've never really been able to listen to Aaliyah's music ever since her passing. It can also, the media cut can also come about because the context of reception of a media text becomes too closely associated with a painful experience, like that was our song. So associating a media text with a severed relationship, for me, that was this terrible melodramatic song by the Bangles, but I can't listen to that song right now. Um, there's this feeling, there can be this feeling of, I hate that person, so I hate their favorite song because it was their song. So this is about a media text being ruined because one's enemy or ex was a fan of it. Um, my brother, in, this happened to my brother-in-law with that um, song Tainted Love by Soft Cell where the person he hated the most at his summer job played it over and over again. So um, I actually want to ask if there could be such a thing as media cutting. And I don't use the term cutting lightly, and one should never use uh, pathology as a metaphor, but I'm not really using it as a metaphor here. I think there may be a relationship or analogy or similarity or family resemblance between cutting one's physical being with a blade and cutting one's emotional or psychological being with a painful piece of media. So if a person returns to the media cut again and again and repetitiously consumes the media text that wounds them um, because reinscribing or deepening the cut also affords some sort of masochistic pleasure. Is that a form of self-harm? Um, what differentiates an enjoyment of feelings of angst or sweet sadness, which is a term that emerges from film theorists of samurai films, uh, what differentiates that feeling of enjoying one's own melancholy from a repetition compulsion that can be damaging to the self? All right, the next thing I want to, um, and I'm going to close with this basically, is the media, the next thing I want to address is this idea of the media scar. So the media scar is when a user no longer feels deeply for a media text, uh, when they are over it, when the media text no longer seems to be able to touch them or move them, when they have reached a point of being meh on it or more or less indifferent to it. So... One way this can manifest is saying, I used to love that song. So one has a fond reminiscence or mild nostalgia for a media object, but nothing more. This happened to me with that great song. Oh, I used to love that song, Smooth. Um, or I used to love that song, but it is so overplayed. So all positive feeling for the text has been exhausted by overexposure, by too much repetition. So one becomes numb to the text and immune to its effects, even if one acutely felt its effects previously. So I'm right on the border of this happening to me with Despacito, and I'm actually rationing out my replaying of Despacito so that I don't get to the media scar too soon. The media scar can also manifest as the person I used to be loved that song. So this is kind of a Proustian notion, a fond reminiscence or mild nostalgia, not for the thing itself, but for the context in which one enjoyed that thing. Um, the life phase, the situation in which one experienced the media crease. Or eventually, I got over it. The scarring over of what was a media crease and or a media cut. After a period of feeling intense emotions for a media text, the strength of the feelings diminish and the media text becomes just another text. And I do believe the media scar can be opened up at certain moments to re-expose the soft, pleasurable crease or the stinging, burning cut that had scarred over. So you can wallow in nostalgia. And one possible timeline of a user's emotional journey with a media text can be that first the user starts in the media crease um, with this passionate enthusiasm, which becomes a media cut, perhaps because the text um, begins to disappoint them or they broke up with the person who introduced them to that text, uh, which becomes a media scar. Uh, eventually, um, the wound heals and scars over. 
How can the media industries collect data on the media cut and the media scar? I talked earlier about how the industries collect data on the media crease, but how do they collect data on the media cut and the media scar? Well, first of all, there is some data on reuse to glean from instances of media cutting, which is what I proposed as the term for repetitive consumption of a text that hurts. But because that person, by the way, because that person is still reusing the text, even if it hurts, but media industries probably can't distinguish between painful and joyful reuse, and also media cutting probably combines joy and pain. And media cutting leaves, so media cutting leaves traces of reuse, similar to the media crease, but the difference in the affective valence between those types of reuse cannot be easily detected from the traces. So what data can be collected? on the cessation of reuse or the turn of like into indifference or dislike. So fans often like to argue that if a popular media text uh, takes a direction that they don't agree with, that all the fans will lose their interest right away. But the data shows that's not true. Some popular characters were recently killed off from The Walking Dead, On the 100, and that did not cause a huge drop in ratings. It did cause a dip in the case of The Walking Dead, but it didn't end the show. And, you know, Star Wars and Marvel films seemingly have a guaranteed audience, no matter how good or bad the individual titles are. Of course, there are cases when an entire fan base reaches a consensus that the media text is just bad. And this is where that term jumped the shark comes from to um, communicate about that consensus. There is often a group performance of the transformation of like into dislike because haters post in droves online. So the media industries can collect that data because hating is an expression of a collectively experienced media cut. But the media scar might be fairly exempt from industrial data collection. The exhaustion of a media text as a resource for pleasure might leave almost no public traces. The media scar may only be registered in the decreasing cultural importance or significance of a media text over time so that texts in one um, decade that are landmarks of that decade are forgotten in the next decade. Their long tail comes to an end. And I'll close with this question, regardless of how the media industries treat our creases, cuts and, cuts and scars, what are we to make of our own kinks, our own wounds, our own closures, if we give a full accounting of our experiences of media, how media has affected us, what do we learn from our own record of use about ourselves, our lives, our histories, our world? Do we perceive ourselves anew? Do we surprise ourselves? Do we comprehend the totality of our human journey differently when we understand that media effects have been our constant companions through that journey? Do we know ourselves better? Thank you so much for having me today. <laughs> Ashley, are we doing questions? Okay. Or people could also just yeah, project. Shout. Mm -hmm. Whichever you feel most comfortable. But do we have any questions? And I should also say that, Gail, if you have any questions for the audience. Yeah. You know, I, would, I would love some you know, speculative answers about these questions, if possible. Or any reactions really would be so helpful. Yes. I could just talk sure. about um, so what, one of the things I was interested with this idea of the crease, of, I was thinking a literal crease mm. is um, through repeated use is that I, it reminded me when I first came across it was Christopher Isherwood and mm. I loved his Berlin stories and I saw another book of his and it was actually autographed by him. Mm. But it was paperback and it was old and I was like, I knew if I immediately opened it and looked like it was never been creased, mm -hmm. it would... It would be... It would be... It would fall apart. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. crease... It was like virginal crease, if you will. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm curious about like this, you know, like the, the other side, not just like something like a virginal crease, but like degradation of media through lack of use. 
Yeah. Or, or, or lack because of it's attention. not used sort of like at the right time or it's yeah. not used when it was built to be used. Be and used. so it degrades because of that. And yeah. also just some things were cheaply made. too, yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, I like both of those because those are both quite different non-use uh, creases, I think. Like one is about the thing not being used ever, and so even the first touch would destroy it. That's really interesting. And then the second form of crease that is related to non-use is just that it would have still worked if it had ever been used, <laughs> but since it was never used, now it's a very it's very precarious and prone to a creasing that is destruction. So I, I really enjoy those additions. Yeah, um, to this idea of creasing. So mm -hmm. really like I think, you know, in terms of metaphor, that yeah. that's like very specific and also to cheap paperbacks, yes. right? But, yes, um, So curious about like how to relate this, you know, understanding of fandom and use mm -hmm. and repeated use to, to, I hate to say it's opposite, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but to this other issue of, of um, de degradation, mm -hmm. if you will, through lack of use. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is someone like the comic book guy in The Simpsons whose house is filled with untouched, unopened, toys or you know all kinds of uh, paratextual um, media related to mass media and the idea of their value being completely dependent on non-use so that even the slightest touch would be a crease beyond that would it wouldn't destroy the object in those cases but it would destroy all value it would destroy value to him the collector it would destroy its you know price on the eBay market so I, I do think there's a lot lot about creasing and non-use to be explored. That's all really great. And I would say it does the paperback industry, of course, depended on a lot of cheap printing. Um, like mass printing is especially uh, degraded format compared to expensive printing. Um, and yet there's something really beautiful in cheap mass paperback printing, which is that we do get these nice sharp creases because that's the amount of glue that was used in all mass produced romance novels. And we don't get those for, for differently printed books or the crease varies a lot more with different kinds of expensiveness of printing. But when a huge genre is all printed at the same level of cheapness, I like that the crease is so consistent and so visible. Yeah. Um, how would you define, oh, how would you identify the media cut-in, as you refer mm -hmm. in the digital form, mm -hmm. to the analog form. Yeah. Uh, how is that different? How do we know that uh, that was media cut-in or yeah. that was the enjoyment you know, of repetition? I exactly know the example I'm going to use because I thought this film did such a great job of dramatizing it. If anyone's seen the Silver Linings Playbook, a um, movie by David O. Russell, uh, there's a point in which the protagonist, Pat, is reading The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway. And at one point, he closes the book and throws it out the attic window. And that, to me, is rage quitting in an analog sense. Um, it's the moment when your favorite character dies and you're just done. You've totally had it with that book. Even if you loved it until that moment, um, the text didn't go your way. And, um, you know, I've, I've actually seen that book thrown out a window or at least thrown across the room kind of metaphor a lot since Silver Linings, that people are sort of picking that up as a trope of a kind of analog experience like actually there's some tags on um, Tumblr and Twitter that relate to like precisely like oh I never thought I would throw a book across the room but it just happened and it was this book so yeah I think people are enacting that. And do you think that in the way that um, right now with digital media is not traceable by the industry mm -hmm. is there a way to trace back and actually put a category yeah. on on the analog version. Yeah, right. I think the romantic um, movement in England was such a good um, time for people to record their own experiences of feeling their responses to art and culture. And um, I think it depends, the analog version really depends on genres of expression that are really about quite profound feelings. Um, I think that's why I went to Proust in um, 
describing the media scar because uh, you really need to find, in the analog, you need to find um, times and genres where it was very encouraged among those writers or artists to talk in very nuanced ways about what they are feeling, um, how the world is affecting them, not what they are putting out there, but what's coming in or what's coming in too much or what they have to start, you know, putting boundaries around or something. So I don't think it's all, it's been throughout history that we have those records. I think it's only in specific movements um, that we really feel like, oh, wow, that was a quite profound reaction people had. We do have some social history that allows us to get at that information. Like we have the information around Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther. Um, we have a lot of newspaper reports of suicides where suicide notes directly relate to that text. So that really is a media cutting that is so deep and evident. And then the other kind of data we have is Moretti's um, rise of the novel sorts of big data graphs, you know, his digital humanities um, distant reading method that allows us to see the popularity of novels just soaring in certain times. And then we can see the media crease, at least for a genre, we have that social history. But I think it would be hard in the analog era. Our social media era is like the romantics era. It was, it, this is a profound moment of self-expression and really making public a lot of how we're feeling deeply. So this might pass too. Maybe social media, this is how social media is used in this time. And maybe in 20 years, no one <laughs> will want to put all of that out there. So yeah. I wonder, it's an interesting question. And I just recently, this past week, a friend posted a photograph on Instagram of a pile of paperback books that they bought online, like through eBay or mm. something. And the way that they were laid out, you could see the spine creases. Yeah. And so I do also wonder if at least in more recent historical media, not that it's historical, but like in an analog paperback, mm -hmm. right, or these different forms that can be now re-archived and resold online, that if some sort of, you know, now they're being integrated into these new media, and so there is a crossing there, mm, yeah. at least in more recent historical, you know, mm -hmm. like, not anciently, but... Yeah, I think the fetishization of vinyl will also maybe um, maybe part of that fetishization will be a fetishization of trace, um, of the physical trace on the vinyl, as I was saying. Or someone in uh, who had seen some of this work said that uh, an old record store in Chicago, a used vinyl record shop, uh, somebody bought a vinyl album from there and inside it were notes on each track, um, just someone's you know quick reviews of each song on the album. So I know that in analog formats, there were creases, there was evidence left, traces of reuse. And yeah, maybe we'll find more of those traces um, because this is a moment of self-expression and because we do fetishize analog formats. So maybe that'll rise uh, in the future. Yeah. The tool two thoughts. The first is I once made an invention of a book where the words disappear after you read them. Mm. So you would have basically, if you know how we read books, you know, we skip over things. So after reading the book once, there would be only the passages left which you did not read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that would be the medium where you could not apply your creases mm -hmm. in a positive, identifying way, but as a negative space. Yes, right. And then coming to the... I, feel, I like that idea of like maybe media shame or something. <laughs> or back to this question of non-use, too. The yeah, creasing right. being around non-use. Or actually of evading the repetition mm -hmm. of revisiting space, uh, places. So if you go to For the sure. second to last slide mm -hmm. where you ask the questions, yeah, do we know ourselves better? So I felt during your talk that you created a mirror for myself mm -hmm. by using current media which are surrounding us. So basically, I'm the old self, mm -hmm. or I have questions and desires and fears which probably seven billion other people have in, with different weights, but it's, yeah. We're all afraid, we all have desires. Mm -hmm. So basically, 
what I saw you describing with the cuts and scars and kinks and wounds <coughs> and closures actually reflected the ancient human question of repetition, of being in a loop, mm -hmm. and that actually these very personal questions which we all share, mm -hmm. so they're only personalized, have been with us for, for millennia. Mm -hmm. And that you described for me how this is actually reflected with the current media as there are the media we trade in these days. So the questions, especially the last one you asked, mm -hmm. so you're not taking the approach of saying how does media industry exploit what you describe, mm -hmm. but you're asking how do I perceive myself mm -hmm. being confronted with your talk, looking into this mirror yes. of tweezers and saying what is my relationship to my own loops and yes. repetitions mm -hmm. and needs to reconfirm myself. Yes. So it's not so much the crease but it's a function of the crease in relationship to how I live or what I feel yes. or what I think I am. Yes, precisely. I, I think, you know, a larger... I end on this slide because uh, my my goal is not really to scaremonger people about the data the media industries is collecting on our creases. Of course, we all must be very aware of privacy and surveillance issues and how we are being rendered into a human resource um, and how our desires are being commodified and all of that. We we must acknowledge that is happening. But the the greatest my greatest hope for this work is not to make us afraid, but to make us more involved with ourselves, to make us more aware of media as something that is our companion through our lives and we relate to those companions and not to disavow them. And um, you know, one thing that I find even with my undergraduates, even with 18 year olds, is how much people have been trained by our society to dismiss their own affective relationship to media. Um, not to high culture, I think people are trained to sort of have a kind of romantic relationship with high culture, but whether it's shame or just that it doesn't get talked about very much, I don't think people hold up that mirror to themselves very frequently when it comes to how deeply they have invested themselves in popular music, in television that they watch, in movies that they see. I think there is so much humanity there. And and it would be wonderful to have more terms to describe how we are human in those relationships. So thank you for that great comment. And right behind you, yes. We'll take one or two more questions. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I noticed uh, when you were talking about the reasons for the media cut or the media scar mm -hmm. that a lot of your examples were musical. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if that was coincidental or whether you think there's something unique or maybe even... Uh, kind of visceral about how music impacts people? Um, you know, I teach sound design and music is one of my go-to uh, media relationships. But I do think, I noticed that about myself too, whereas a lot of my earlier examples were about visual or audiovisual um, objects. And I do think there is something about popular music that... Um, it, it, it is so, the, the, the um, pendulum swings so hard from crease to cut to scar. It is just so definite. If, you know, I feel like, um, I won't ask people to raise their hands, but just think about if you've ever had a romantic relationship. Do you know the song of that relationship? Do you know the song that was your song? Okay, great. Are you in a relationship with that song that is a media crease or a media cut or a media scar? I feel like people can answer that question really definitively with songs and maybe less so with, you know, Marvel movies. Like a lot of people are just indifferent towards them. <laughs> like who cares, you know? I mean, they might like Iron Man, but they don't, they don't, uh, I mean, of course some fans love Iron Man, but, um, but the way that people are with songs is so definitive. It's like Proust's, um, um, you know, Madeline 
has nothing on like uh, tainted love for my brother-in-law. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just the degree of definitive classification of whether you love a song, hate it right now, or realize that, you're, that your relationship with that song is just over. I think people just know that much more viscerally with music. That's my instinct. I have zero data on that. <laughs> Maybe one more? Yeah. The last two. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering what you think in the digital world when it comes to fandom. I know you've been looking at that too. Um, when it goes from the crease to the cut to the scar, what's next? Yeah. Um, when a fan is is then because of the digital realm mm -hmm. actually, um, you know, has the agency to become the creator. Yeah. And um, work that over and over again. Thank you. Yes, I did not include, I mean, that was only a proto thought in my mind after I did the scar slides. But thank you so much because that did, it was a little nascent thought in my head and I do think that happens now. So now I absolutely think that certain mass media, because we have a long history, you know, Star Trek debuted 51 years ago now. So we have a half century of explicitly performed media fandom now and a tradition of fan cultures and communities. Now we do see fans becoming professional media makers. Um, and of course there's a lot of amateur stuff on YouTube too that deliberately redoes the things that wounded them, I think. So I do think especially the media cut is being hugely addressed <laughs> through fans' productions, but a lot of those are professional productions. So there's a great show that was just canceled, sadly, it's become a media cut, although fans are trying to campaign to revive it, called Dark Matter, which is a Canadian sci-fi show. On Here it's broadcast on the cable channel Sci-Fi. And um, that show is Firefly by Joss Whedon. It is also Star Trek Voyager. It's also Star Trek Next Generation. And it's also the Jessica Alba, James Cameron series, Dark Angel. I can so clearly see the creators um, you know, his huge disappointment, his media cut, those shows were all canceled too early. He loved certain characters so much and wanted more of them. He got to create his show that combines all of his favorite shows from the past and does them the right way. I definitely think production is the next phase, but I don't have a nice word for it yet. <laughs> I mean, what is it in therapy when you're able to rehabilitate something or, or revise it in your mind so that it's, you're healthy about it or something? I think whatever's, whatever that is, there are a lot of media producers. Ron D. Moore is a huge, you know, was a huge Star Trek fan and is now a famous media producer. Um, I think Guillermo del Toro, most of his films are about his own fanish psychology and his relation to media texts. So I would love to come up with a good phrase or word that would sum that energy up and I'll work on that. And if that occurs to you, email me. <laughs> Thank you for that. Should we take the last one? Sure, yeah. Um. So it seems like when, like back in the analog, when you wanted to see someone else's creases, like the only way you really see that is if you had borrowed that video or you mm -hmm. borrowed the book. Uh, but in the digital world, it seems almost kind of the opposite, where it's you're projecting it on the Tumblr, right. you're projecting it on the Twitter. Right. Um, do you think That's that a good point. like causes creases to be more prevalent in the sense that once you start seeing this crease over and over? <coughs> then you yourself sort of make it into a crease? Like, do you think that has yeah. a big effect on culture? I do think so, and I think the hashtag is a perfect example where people almost in, in immediately knew how to use that, which was to make, which was to be a convex crease, to make that crease really visible, to make it big and noticed. Um, that's why people talk about hashtag activism, that it's a way to draw attention to issues. I do think that social media is large, 
are social media platforms are largely performance platforms. So the crease in social media is highly performative, whereas the crease in the analog um, formats, I think people, if people could have hidden those, I think they might have hidden them. Like if there was, if, if romance novels could have not been so cheaply printed and people could have kept their rereading more private and secret, I think they would have opted for that. I think if that person had borrowed his friend's Kentucky Fried movie and could not have glitched it up, he would have opted for that. So um, I do think the media crease in the analog period was such a, it had such a different impulse behind behind it, or maybe more shame or guilt. And the impulse in uh, the social media crease is to be so performative, so external, um, to immediately group and assemble and aggregate. Um, I do, th I think that's a great point. That is, that seems to be a major difference. And of course, I think we see reactions against that in social media too. I think we see people making accounts private um, or password locking them or friends locking them as people say um, or having media policies that they don't post on Instagram about certain things because it's too meaningful to them. So I think now we are seeing people make individual decisions about what is too emotionally affective for me to put out into the world. And like I said, like we were talking about, you know, earlier, um, I, I, I have a feeling social media norms might really change in definitely in our lifetimes, but maybe even kind of soonish, uh, that maybe it'll be a quite juvenile uh, mode of using social media to put oneself all out there and that to be adult on social media might be to be much more private than we are now. I think that could happen um, soonish. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you all of you. Great comments and questions. <laughs>